Good morning, Unity, and happy Mother's Day. I'm Jonathan Purcell, Reverend Wendy's son. She'll be on in just a moment to have her fourth lesson on her book, Ask Yourself This. And so sit back, relax, bring mom along so she can listen in, uh, and we'll get started shortly. The Unity Center live streams every one of its Sunday services at 10 a.m. Uh, every Sunday morning. And if you're watching a recording of this, you can find it on YouTube or the Unity Center Facebook page. If you are watching uh, through one of those channels, uh, consider sharing the video or liking it on Facebook and answering your favorite question that Reverend Whitney asks. Or if you're on YouTube, you can join one of our 5,000 subscribers to the Unity Center page uh, and never miss another uh, lesson that is posted. And a special uh, message to my dear grandmother, Lori. I I'm gonna step away for just a moment but I swear your daughter's gonna be on in just a few, few minutes and there's nothing wrong with your computer. Happy Mother's Day, Lori, and I love you. Good morning, Unity family, and a very, very happy Mother's Day to all of the moms, to stepmoms, moms-to-be. And I also want to just suggest that we hold a very tender place in our hearts for those who have lost their moms recently. I know that first Mother's Day, when your mom's no longer with you, can just be very tender and very um, very sad. So we send a special blessing to all who may be impacted that way. I'm Wendy Craig Purcell and I'm the minister here at the Unity Center broadcasting from my home in Poway during our time of sheltering in place. And if you are watching for the very first time and you do live in the San Diego area, consider joining us some Sunday morning when we get back to our beautiful facility in San Diego. We're going to start now with the striking and the playing of our antique Tibetan singing bowl. And I invite you just to sit back and to allow these sounds to help you just center in to this time and this space, wherever you are.
Let's join together in a moment of prayer. I invite you, if you haven't already closed your eyes, to go ahead and do so. Allowing your attention to move within as together we create this opportunity of shared support, shared love, shared community. Giving thanks for the presence and the power, the wisdom and the love of spirit that guides and directs us, sustains and supports us. Grateful for this opportunity to be together even in this way. Taking a moment to set the intention that in our time together, we will remember something or hear something that inspires us, that encourages us, that helps us to live and create a happier and more meaningful life. And we know the power of intention, we know the power of the spoken word to create. And so we set that intention, we speak that word aloud or silently, and then we let those words go out into the infinite, knowing that they do not return to us empty, but they help to co-create the life that we wish to live. And so it is, and so we begin. Amen and amen. During this time of sheltering in place, I've been introducing you to some of the artists that we have had at the Unity Center over the years. And I want to give a brief shout out to Empower Music, which is a um, online music service that many of us in New Thought rely on for the wonderful artists and programs and music and resources they provide to individuals as well as to New Thought communities all around the world. And today I'd like to feature one of the artists that we've had at the Unity Center before and I hope we can have her back real soon. Her name is Janice Stanfield. And the song that I've selected that supports the opening energy of our service today is her song, I Am One. And I really hope you'll listen to these words and just take them in as truth of your being as well. I am one. And that was Janice Stanfield, her song, I Am One. Did your arms get tired holding up the towel, Jonathan? <laughs> if you were with us last week and watched after the um, the video and live stream was over, we shot a picture of what this looks like for me for standing in front of this lectern in my family room. And when we have one of our artists uh, on the iPad, the image on the iPad, my son Jonathan is standing with a great big towel behind John so that the glare from the sunlight doesn't obstruct the picture of the beautiful artist. But his arms were shaking because it was a somewhat long song. So thank you for helping to co-create the service, Jonathan. So I have some readings for today's message. And as Jonathan mentioned at the start of our time together, we are in the fourth chapter of my book, Ask Yourself This, Questions to Open the Heart, Expand the Mind, and Awaken the Soul. And today I want to share with you some questions to build a happier, more meaningful life. And here are some readings that support this. The first is from Marcus Aurelius, the Roman Emperor. Very little is needed to make a happy life. It is all within yourself, in your way of thinking. That sounds really new thought, doesn't it? And this is from a very long time ago. Here's one from the transcendentalist Henry David Thoreau. A man is rich in proportion to the things he can afford to let alone. That is wisdom for some deep thinking, I think. A man is rich in proportion to the things he can afford to let alone, the things he, doesn't, he realizes he really doesn't need. Here's one from Eleanor Roosevelt. When you cease to make a contribution, you begin to die. From Albert Schweitzer. At times, our own light goes out and is rekindled by a spark from another person. Each of us has cause to think with deep gratitude of those who have lighted the flame within us. And this last one is from George Bernard Shaw. The true joy of life, the being used up for a purpose recognized by yourself as a mighty one, being a force of nature 
instead of a feverish, selfish, little clot of ailments and grievances. That's pretty vivid. Complaining that the world will not devote itself to making you happy. I am of the opinion that my life belongs to the community. And as long as I live it, it is my privilege to do for it what I can. As long as I live, it is my privilege to do for it what I can. Not to complain that the world owes itself or is devoted to making me happy, but I'm here for the life of the community. Some important reminders, I think, to us, especially during this time. I'd like to invite us to move into a time of meditation together right now. And this morning, for some of our background um, meditation music, our beloved director of music, Janet Hammer, prepared a piece for me that um, you'll get a chance to listen to in the background. So I invite you right now to go ahead and find a comfortable position in your chair or wherever you are to be able to relax and to go ahead and close your eyes. And as you do, to begin to turn your attention inward And as you know, our practice in unity, our meditation practice, is a practice of mindfulness. Being aware of each breath, the breath as we take it into the body, and the breath as we let it go. And using this simple technique of mindful breathing to help us relax, to empty out, and to be more fully present. So take a deep breath in now. And as you let that breath go, truly feel yourself releasing and letting go. And taking another deep and mindful breath in and releasing that breath. And as you do, feeling yourself fully present, right here, wherever you are. And again, a deep and mindful breath in. And releasing that breath. And opening up opening to this moment, to this experience. Continuing to be with the breath. The very gentle yet steady awareness of the breath. Aware of the breath in. Aware of the breath out. Letting go. Being present. And opening up. Mindful of the breath in, mindful of the breath out, letting go, being present, and opening up. Ever so gently now, direct your attention to the area of the heart, the center of your chest, 
Imagining that each mindful breath is moving in and through the area of the heart. Each mindful breath moving in and through the area of the heart. Feeling such a sense of peace and calm. Fully present. You might find it helpful as you continue to be aware of the breath with attention focused in the area of the heart. You might find it helpful to practice holding a positive feeling. One may have already come into your awareness. If so, go with that. If not, perhaps hold the feeling of gratitude or love. or peace, or joy. Continuing to be mindful of the breath. Attention focused in the area of the heart. Breathing in and out. that uplifting and healing emotion. Practice now for just a few minutes with only the sound of the music and the awareness of your breath to guide you ever deeper into this time of stillness presence and prayer. Begin now to bring your attention and awareness up out of this deeper time of stillness and silence, this deeper experience of prayer and meditation. Taking just a moment to feel grateful for this shared time together. Thank you, Spirit. Thank you. And so it is. Amen. And amen. And namaste. In fact, if you are enjoying this morning with a loved one, turn to them right now and greet them with the salutation, namaste. The God in me, the divine in me, the spirit in me, 
recognizes the same in you. Namaste. And so I have one more piece of music that I want to share with you. <clears throat> Excuse me, this is another one from Jana Stanfield. And I've got to tell you, Jana, if you're tuned into this, this is one of my husband's favorite songs and sayings, as well as our daughter Jennifer's. The song is, I'm not lost, I'm just exploring. But Jana, he uses that as an excuse when we really are lost and the GPS doesn't, doesn't work. Honey, I'm not lost, I'm just exploring. path I walk from somewhere way up high I could see the crooked road that I have come I walked a mile with sorrow I walked a mile with joy and now I'm less afraid of either one for every tear I've cried there's a smile that I have earned for every Thank you, Jana. Joy as my compass and faith as my map. I'm not lost. I'm just exploring. I think that actually is a, an important idea to hold in mind as we look out and look forward with this thought of what's involved in creating a happier and more meaningful life. As you know, my book, Ask Yourself This, questions to expand the mind, open the heart, and awaken the soul is all based on my belief that having some really good questions that we hold at key times in our lives is really important um, to building a quality life because the questions that we ask become like channels through which our creative energy flows, through which our attitude flows. And so 
having these questions, I think, is really important. And I have a few that I want to share with you this morning with regard to what's involved in building a happier and more meaningful life. The first question is this, what really matters to me? Say that with me. What really matters to me? What really matters to me? I think there are key times in our lives that we really need to stop and ask ourselves that question. I think any time of great change in our lives, loss of a loved one, loss of a lifestyle, loss of a career path, that it's really powerful to stop and ask, so now, what really matters to me? And not to take in the answers that others may think are the right answers, but to sit deeply in that question until we have greater clarity for ourselves on what that answer is. A number of years ago, at the Seattle Special Olympics, there were nine contestants, all of whom were physically or mentally disabled or challenged in some way. They were children, and they were all assembled at the starting line of a 100-yard dash. And when the gun went off for them to start, they all kind of were, were ready to go and eager to get to the, the finish line. Um, and so they, they started, and all of a sudden, one little boy started to, to stumble and to fall, and he started to cry. And the other eight children looked back and started to retreat from going toward the finish line and went back to try to help this little boy that they were competing against who had fallen and who was crying. And a little girl with Down syndrome leaned over and gave him a kiss and said, here, this will make it better. And then they got up and linked arms with him and then all nine of them went to the finish line together. I wasn't there to see that, but I remember the first time I heard about that story, I got God bumps everywhere because it struck such a chord for me of remembering what really matters most. I think it was Maya Angelou who said, people re will not remember what you said and they probably won't remember what you did. I think I'm paraphrasing her here, but they will never forget how you made them feel. To those children, they knew what mattered. And it wasn't, even though they, they wanted to be the winner of that, that race, they knew that what mattered was this little boy who had fallen and was sad. There's an African proverb that says, you can go fast if you go alone, but if you want to go far, you've got to go with others. You've got to go with others. And aren't we experiencing that in a really profound way right now. We are all in this together. We may not like the this, I, we don't like the this, but we are all in this together and we will get through this pandemic much better if we find a way to get through it together, not making a demon out of the other, but finding a way to love and support and encourage one another. Tolstoy said, he who has a why can stand almost any what. He who has a why can stand almost any what. So, so we have this opportunity right here and now to sharpen our viewpoint around what really matters. What really matters? To sharpen our viewpoint around what really matters. A wise woman was hiking in the mountains when she found a, a very rare and precious stone in a stream. She picked it up and she put it in her bag. And the next day she was traveling again and she met a man who was um, hungry and poor. And she offered to give him something to eat and in doing so she opened her bag in which the hungry and poor man looked in and saw the precious stone. And she was prepared to give him something to eat. But he noticed that stone and he said, I'd rather have that. And without a moment's hesitation, the wise woman reached in and went ahead and gave him this precious stone because he knew that it would provide the means for, of food and sustenance for him for a very long time. And he left feeling very good. But a couple of days later, he came back. And he came back with that stone and gave that stone to the woman saying, 
I want to know what it was in you that caused you to give me that stone. I give it back to you because I recognize that what is more valuable than that stone is whatever it was in you that caused you to give it to me. In other words, he was perhaps even wiser than the wise woman. Somehow something got triggered inside of him in that understanding that there, <clears throat> excuse me, that there was something much more important than just the materialisticness of what that stone represented. And that woman embodied what that something more was, what that something was that really mattered. You know, our teacher and way shower, Jesus of Christ, talked about the same thing. All of these ideas that we think might be so new and so contemporary have their roots in all of the world's major spiritual traditions and religions, Christianity as well. Jesus talked about putting God first and then everything would be added unto us. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto you as well. But you know what, sometimes what, what putting, sometimes to put what matters most at the front and center of our lives, <clears throat> excuse me, means that we have to let go of some things. As I have been leading some midweek Zoom check-ins during this time of sheltering in place is one of my ways of reaching out and supporting our members and wherever they may be during this very difficult time. One of the things that I have heard again and again from those on these calls is how they are using this time to reflect and get clearer on what really matters to them. And in the recognition of what really matters to them, they are also recognizing that some other things in their lives need to drop. The poet, the Sufi poet Rumi said that we were to be like a tree and let the dead leaves drop. To be like a tree and let the dead leaves drop. To be like a tree and let the dead leaves drop. And you know, if we think about a tree in fall when the leaves are dropping, the tree, if I can anthropomorphize here for a moment, does not have to do anything to make those dead leaves drop. They just eventually drop because they have served their purpose and now they have another purpose to, to nourish the tree. But it also occurred to me that sometimes the wind comes along and kind of helps some of those leaves to drop. And I choose to look at this situation that we are experiencing together, this sheltering in place, this serious pandemic. I'm choosing to see this is almost like the winds of change blowing through, saying to us individually and collectively, what really matters most? Now that you're in this global timeout, will you take a moment to look and get clearer on what really matters most? And will you admit that some things need to drop, some beliefs, some ways of living, some ways of being need to drop? Second question, who paid the price for me? Say that with me, please. Who paid the price for me? Now, sometimes a question like this can be asked from a place of shaming another or trying to guilt another. And if you're a part of New Thought, you know that that's not ever our motivation. We don't scare people into believing. We don't shame or guilt people into believing. So this question that I pose to help build a more meaningful and happier life does not come from a place of guilt at all to explore who paid the price for me. Rather, it comes from a place of perspective and from a place of genuine gratitude and appreciation. When I think of a question like this, who paid the price for me? I cannot, I cannot help but appreciate and have deep gratitude for the freedoms that we have in this country. I remember vividly standing with my son and husband and daughter, uh, looking over the beaches of Normandy and just reflecting on the power and the impact and the significance of, of that day and what it represented and the tremendous sacrifice that was made by so many people to help provide safety and protection and to end that, that horrible, horrible war. I think of um, the E-Day, Victory Europe Day, that we just celebrated 75 years on Friday. Thank you, Hans, for reminding me. 
and for sharing, Hans is a member of our community, that those of European descent in our community, including him and his family, still feel a debt of gratitude toward the Americans and the Allies for, for help and support. Who paid the price for me? How about those on the front line right now fighting this virus? I bet every one of us wishes so much that we could do something more, that we could do something more. And while we can, you know, and should express our gratitude and hold our frontline workers in our prayers, I think the greatest way that we can honor the work that we're doing is to make sure we do not fall back asleep and make some of the same kinds of mistakes in the way that we have treated one another in the past, that we stay awake and we are really committed to a new way of living, a new way of being that doesn't leave anyone out, that does not demonize or marginalize anyone. How many of you are familiar with the very, um, the very well-known image of the praying hands? I bet many of you are. I bet as soon as I say that, you can draw that image to mind. But do you know that that image that um, most of us call to mind of those praying hands, do you know the story behind that? Let me tell you the story behind that. It is a story of two brothers, Albrecht and Albert Dürer. They lived in Nuremberg, Germany at the turn of the 15th century, 14th to 15th century. They were two of 18 children. That's a story enough there, but I don't have time to go into that. Both of them dreamt of, of getting out of the coal mines, which is where their, most of their family worked, and, and dreamt of getting out of that and pursuing a passion and a love for art. But they realized that the family was way too poor to put both of them to school, through schools. So they decided to do a toy, a toy cost, toss, I'll get it right yet, a coin toss, and whoever won the toss would get to go to an art academy for four years and the other would work in the coal mines. Well, Albert lost the toss and so he had to go work in the coal mines while his brother Albrecht went into the art academy and he had a lot of natural ability. He was um, very talented in oil painting and in silver work and in drawing and in pen and ink. And when he was done with school, he came back and the town was ready to give him a big party to welcome him home. And so the village people were gathered and he, Albrecht wanted to toast his brother Albert for the sacrifice that he had made of those four years of working in the coal mines so Albrecht could go off to, to school. And as he toasted his brother, he said to him, and now it's your turn to go. And the story is that Albert looked at him and said, but I can't. The four years in the coal mines, look at my hands. They are crippled with arthritis. They are bent and gnarled and broken. I, could, I can barely do the work in the mine. I certainly can't hold a paintbrush or do anything detailed. My time has passed. Well, Albrecht did not want his brother to be forgotten. And with his talent of pen and ink drawing, drew that beautiful, beautiful set of what we call the praying hands, but it was to honor his brother. He was clear on who paid the price for him, wasn't he? Third question, what do you have to give? What do you have to give? Say that with me. What do you have to give? Another one of my favorite poets is the poet Khalil Gibran. And in his book, The Prophet, in his poem, his piece on giving, is the line, to give is to live, to withhold is to perish. To give is to live, to withhold is to perish. We know that giving and receiving are, are intertwined. Just think of your breath. You take in a breath, you receive the air, but you can't keep it forever. You have to expel it. You have to let it go. Gibran is right. To give is to live. To withhold is to perish. We all have something to give. And it's so easy for us to shut down and think, well, right now I can barely make ends meet. Don't think for a moment that giving is limited to just 
to our, our financial resources. Those of us who can support and give financially, by all means, that is one of many paths of giving. But no matter what, we all have something to give. Whether it is an encouraging word, what's the expression, a candle loses nothing by lighting another candle? There are those in, in your life who need an encouraging word from you, a pat on the shoulder when you can give them a pat on the shoulder again, or a hug when we can hug them again, or a note or an email or some encouraging word. I like to walk in my neighborhood, and it's been interesting to me to see the different things that I see now when I'm walking, people leaving chalk um, messages on their driveways. And the other day I was touched by somebody giving something very simple that put a huge smile on my face. I turned the corner and there one of my neighbors had a simple cardboard box painted and a sign on it. The cardboard box was propping up the sign and the sign simply said, I love roses. I love flowers. We have so many and when I look at flowers, they put a smile on my face. And right in front was a bucket with some of the most beautiful roses and beneath it was the take one if you like one. Take one if it will put a smile on your face. I did take one and it did put a smile on my face. Thank you Richard for making that happen. We all have something to give. One of my greatest joys when I go for my morning walk, I've been doing this for, for several years now, is I always take a dog treat in my pocket and it happened because one day I was out walking and there was this really, really, really old dog walking with this master. And I don't know who was walking slower. The dog was walking very slow. And I started to chat with the neighbor and befriend the neighbor and his dog. And I asked one day, can I bring a treat for Leo? And I started, well, Leo has since passed, but I still carry those dog treats. And now Leo's um, replacement, if you can ever replace a beloved pet, um, gets the treats that, that I give. It puts, you know, it, it sounds like I'm the one giving, but I think I'm the one receiving. I'm receiving so much joy when I see those dogs come up to me wagging their tail. They can't figure out why I can't pet them right now, so I'm just throwing the treats to them. My point is, it doesn't have to be something monumental, but it does have to be something. It wants to be something. When we come with a giving heart, giving whatever it is, that we have, that we can give, encouragement, support, physical help. It makes a difference and it really does matter. Fourth question, what if this could be easy and fun? Say that with me. What if this could be easy and fun? That's when I have to ask myself often because my mom used to say, and I guess she must be right, happy Mother's Day mom. My mom used to say, Wendy, you were born serious. And I think she's probably right. Seriousness and discipline and conscientiousness come naturally to me, almost to excess perhaps. And so I'll never forget one day being in a, on a prayer call with one of my prayer partners. And whatever it was we were praying about, my prayer partner asked me, Wendy, what if you let this be easy and fun? And my first inclination was to be angry with him. And what I've learned is whenever I feel a little annoyed or perturbed when somebody asks me a question like that, it's usually because there's some defensiveness going on because they've touched something that I need to take a look at. And I thought, wow, wow, what if I could make this easy and fun? And my prayer partner was not suggesting a Pollyanna attitude. My prayer partner was not being insensitive to whatever it was that I was going through at that time. But what I think he was attempting to help me see was I could hold both. That I could bring whatever aspect of reason and thinking and will to the situation that the situation maybe really needed by, but at the same time, I could also hold for the possibility that there might be a somewhat easier way to move through, that I might be able to find a way to make it a little less heavy, a little lighter. And you know, I've never forgotten that question of his. In fact, that's why it's one that I put in my book. What if this could be easy and fun? 
you know, there's always another way to go through things than, the, than just one way. There's always more than one way to go through something. A, a, a person living in Preston, Idaho a number of years ago lived on a street in which there were lots and lots of potholes. And despite numerous phone calls to the street department to come and repair these potholes, the, the, the person could never get anybody to come out and do it. And it was getting to the point where it was dangerous to drive because if the tires got caught in the pot wheels, then they could, um, they could result in damage to the tires. But yet none of the, the normal requests of the street department um, ended in the problem being fixed. And so one of the neighbors noticed that the very next day that that neighbor who had been trying so hard to have this pothole fixed had planted a tree, a small tree in the middle of the pothole with flowers all around it. And within three days, the city department had come and removed the tree and repaired the pothole. I think that's a beautiful example of making something a little bit easier, a little more fun. And the last question, and this one I want to credit my former minister, Reverend Robert Stevens, the late Robert Stevens, with. In one of his sermons, he asked the question, is it good morning God or a good God morning? Never forgotten that. Is it good morning God or good God morning? What does that point to? It does not, we're not talking about if you're a morning person or not. Some of us are, some of us aren't. Is it good morning God or good God morning? Points to our attitude about life. Our attitude about life. Do we see it through what's broken, what's missing, what's not working? Is that the only way we see things? Or do we see possibility? What's the attitude we have? Little story from Reader's Digest, Life in these United States years ago, was about two truck drivers who um, were out, one a very seasoned truck driver, the other with him, one in training. And I guess driving these big rigs is, is tiring, and they put in lots and lots and lots and lots of hours, very fatiguing. And when they finally broke for the day, the young truck driver asked the older one, boy, aren't you exhausted? This is just grueling work. And the old truck driver said, no, no. And the young one wanted to know why. And the old one said, well, while you went to work today, I went for a drive in the country. Same truck, completely different experience, right? One had a good morning God, attitude and the other had a good God morning attitude. Which are you? Is there room for improvement? For all of us, that's a rhetorical question, for all of us there's always room for improvement. And so I encourage you to hold maybe your favorite of these five questions in your mind and heart, maybe even journal about them, as to what are your answers and how can you activate and energize yourself to building a happier and more meaningful life. So very quickly recap, the questions were these. One, what really matters to me? Who paid, two, who paid the price for me? Three, what do you have to give? Four, what if it could be easy and fun? And five, is it good God morning or good morning God? Closing thought from Rumi. Let yourself be silently drawn by the strange pull of what you really love, it will not lead you astray. Namaste. We come to the time in our service now where if we were at the church, we would be inviting those of you who are here for the first time to join us for delicious coffee or tea or so forth. If you are new though, as part of our viewing audience, please do feel free to reach out to us. If you have a prayer request, we have a very powerful and active prayer ministry who would be happy to be with you in prayer. Um, and if there are questions that you have about Unity, consider emailing them to us or posting them on the chat. We'll do our very best to get back with you on that. What we believe, what I believe, is so important to anyone's spiritual growth is two things. 
that each individual finds a spiritual teaching that speaks to their mind, their heart, and their soul, and a spiritual community in which they feel comfortable, in which they feel they can be accepted and be themselves while still growing. Excuse me, while still growing. And if anything I've said to you today strikes a resonant chord with you, consider visiting us some Sunday, or if you don't live in San Diego, check out a Unity or New Thought Church wherever you are. Just a few reminders for you before I ask you to join me in blessing our offering and in our closing prayer. Update regarding Sunday services. As soon as San Diego's health order and shelter in place order allows it, Janet Hammer and our Soul Notes band and I will be live streaming our services from our beautiful sanctuary, but we will not do that until the health order allows it. A few activities that we are still providing to support you during this time. On Sundays, right after this um, live stream, we do have a discussion group on Zoom. Anybody is welcome to attend. You do need to register though, and you can reach out to Jenna on our team. I believe she is monitoring the chat now and she can help you if you want to register for that so you can join in just a few moments. My Zoom gatherings uh, will continue um, at, uh, on Wednesday at 10 o'clock and 3.30. We go for an hour. It's a time of inspiration and insight, a time to connect, encourage, and uplift. And I'm going to be focusing on some more sayings and teachings from the Sufi poet Rumi. Midday Centering Prayer with Kim Kennedy is on Thursday afternoons at uh, 12 noontime. And Evening Meditation with David Stanley is on Thursdays at 7 p.m. A few reminders, please be sure to go to our YouTube page and subscribe. You'll get notifications anytime we upload new videos. And there are a lot of videos there. You can also catch up on any of this series that you may have missed and if it would be helpful to you i did create a special guided meditation on abundance that is my gift to you to use during this time um, if it would be helpful to you thank you for remembering the unity center with your continued support those of you who are on recur it really is helping and making a difference so thank you to those of you not on recur it's very easy to get on it if you are willing and able to you can do it uh, through our free Unity Center app, and you can either make a one-time gift or a recurring gift. Let us take a moment right now to hold symbolically or literally in our hands the support that we would like to give to our Unity community. And we'll hold these gifts in our hands, in our minds, in our hearts, and energize them and strengthen them with this affirmation. Divine love flowing through me blesses and multiplies all that I am, all that I have, all that I give, and all that I receive. Divine love flowing through me blesses and multiplies all that I am, all that I have, all that I give, and all that I receive. And so it is. Amen. Again, happy Mother's Day to all of our moms, stepmoms, moms-to-be, a special prayer and blessing to those of you who may be dealing with the loss, the recent loss of your mother. Know that you are in my thoughts and in my hearts. Let us close out together with our prayer of protection now. The light of God surrounds us. The love of God enfolds us. The power of God protects us. And the presence of God watches over us. Wherever we are, wherever we go, God is and all is well. Amen.